Okay, so the next segment we'll be talking about is budgeting for your release. This is the thing that I get the most questions of uh, from a lot of artists that you know want to work with producer or music videos. So generally, you should budget for 15 to 20 hours per song. This is regardless of what, what studio you use, what producers you use. Um, typically, I personally charge on the package rates, and I know many producers also do, but a lot of artists I think in Singapore don't understand that package rates down the road might be more viable option, especially the younger. So at the same time, look at 15 to 20 per hours per song, because most people, when I speak to them, they're like, oh, isn't it a day more en than enough? And when you factor in like, you know, overdubbing, um, editing and everything, that's actually not quite enough to get to the product that needs to be. So you know, always factor for more, and this is sort of a good rough start. Uh, mixing, mix engineers go from anywhere from $300 to $1,500 per song. So again, it's down to your budget, who you're working with. Common mistake people make is not spending enough on recording, expecting the mix en engineer to polish the song and making it sound amazing when they don't have the raw materials too. So it's something that I would really advise, you know. Recording has to be great, then you pass it on to the right mixing engineer, which is like I said, research, research, research a lot. Um, and you know, mastering is also one thing that's like a black art, everyone doesn't know how to pay for it. Uh, I've heard of bands in Singapore who spend, I think, $7,000 on the whole album and actually spend $7,000 on mastering. So that's actually a really bad move to make. And, uh, or, you know, half the budget of, of the recording goes to mastering because they're under the impression that uh, mastering can, you know, save everything and, and can cure cancer at the same time, which is not true. Um, so a good estimate would be 10 to 20% of your recording plus mixing budget. So if you spend $1,000 a song, then $100 a song on mastering is how you should spend. 200 if you really have the extra coin to spend. Um, but you know, don't budget really, really carefully and not overspend on the wrong things. If you have a good producer, your producer can help you out with uh, budgeting as well because part of his job is getting resources for your project. Yeah. So they can advise you accordingly. But in, a, in case yeah. you, you do, self-produce or you just use a recording studio or you just use a recording engineer and, and they'll, they'll, of course they'll recommend someone to you but you know in my opinion and, and working with a lot of people in the industry that's the general question that I get a lot which I thought I'll share my thoughts on it and my opinion on it and I think uh, that's one thing which I want to be very you know upfront about to, to, to caution people to spend correctly because you spend the wrong money in the wrong place and your product could su suffer a lot from those decisions and it's not worth your money or time. Okay, so music video. Um, from my understanding, there's also been a lot of artists who, you know, spend I think maybe a thousand dollars on a song and would spend three thousand dollars on a video, which is not very, very, uh, not a bad idea. But if you're doing a first single, one to one or one to one two ratio is a good starting point. Obviously, more established artists that I've worked with, you know, one to four, one to five, one to ten. Uh, that's, you know, with all the acting, all the props and everything. But generally, you know, if you spend $300 on a recording, don't spend $2,000 on a video. It's not gonna, it's not an even representation of your art. And I think what we're trying to encourage people is to take a good look, overall approach to how you want to put out your music. Spend everything evenly or build up a good budget for to do everything properly rather than one single element. Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket in this case. Because when you do, a lot of results get skewed and they don't get you know accurately presented well enough. Uh, music video ideas for keeping down on the low on the cost. Kids, keep it simple, stupid. Um, a lot of times I spoke with music directors who you know do a, a video for the first, for artists for the first time or they're relatively new. They always tell me, right idea and, and make, it, make sure it's cost effective. Um, sometimes what's more important is good band shots or good artist shots and to be able to sell your personality. That's probably more important than some complicated storyline about a boy meets girl, fireworks and you know really high budget stuff that you can't really afford. So simple, simple things done right will, will stand you a long, long way than overspending. Okay, so some simple concepts that you can think of behind the scenes studio videos. That's really cheap. You're already paying for studio time. Think the place looks good, hopefully. Why not do a studio video there? Lyric videos are cheap. They range from between $300 to $600 per lyric video. Uh, a live video, if you, if you gig a lot and you have a lot of venues to, 
um, perform at, a good thing would be to get a friend to take a couple of you know, videos of a, a few songs, put a montage together of your crowd. That also showcases higher value, demonstrates to your audience that you have people coming to your shows, which is a good thing. Uh, like, so any other point is simple, achievable concept that's concise. Uh, sometimes a one-person video with a good concept works, like Coplay, which is reverse. He's singing everything in reverse, and they just flip it around. So, you know, I think the key thing to take note is don't shoot for the moon. Learn how to walk first. Learn to do something simple well before moving on. Okay. So again, that comes to the point of having a, a good release strategy for your um, singles. So number one hits don't miraculously happen because a lot of people just happen to like your song or it goes viral. A lot of, I think a lot of people saw on a lie that you, know, you just catch on, song's great, and people like it instantly. Everyone loves the song and buys it. And, and that's not exactly the full truth. I think we've always been let this industry talk or lie that you know, these things happen, but they don't. It's all you know, planned out. And one of the simplest ways I found about doing this is to use a pre-order campaign. Uh, Pre-order campaigns are great because every action that you do afterwards feeds towards your campaign. So anything you put out, you can direct it to your song, buy it here, buy it here before this date, and all these things will accumulate, and hopefully when it actually releases, you have enough sales to hit a target of you know, between 500 to 800 singles, which is something that you could use for Singapore metrics, for example. And then you get your number one hit. Yeah. Also, timing is important. If like, you know, Ariana Grande releases a song on the same day as you, or, or especially Taylor Swift, I think the, the week that Taylor Swift released the album, if you release your album or, or single, then no hope. So please do some research on who's releasing stuff beforehand. So if someone big like Taylor puts out an album, I wouldn't even put out any releases any time there. I would run away, run far. So before you get your strategy, you know, again, what's your target market? This is something, if you're on a smaller budget like indie artists, work on an age gap of five years. You know, when I talk to artists, sometimes they tell me, oh, my age group is anywhere from 19 to 35, or 12 to 30. And those numbers, you know, sure, everyone from a certain age will like your music, but that's not the best representation of your resources that you have available to you. Um, so look at five, no more than eight years of a gap in a target market to look at. Understand your value, that's pretty important. Know what you're actually known for. Do people really like your songs more than your voice? If, you, if people like your voice more, maybe get someone to write your songs for you, which is, I think, hard for a lot singer-songwriters to accept, or singers to accept for the example, but uh, that's something that I think, you know, I'd rather tell the truth and, and let everyone know what actually goes on in the industry rather than go, sure, you know, everything's happy and, and write your own songs and just sing them. Being, like I said, being a singer and being a singer-songwriter is two different skill sets and you kind of need to be 100% on both. So find out your unique selling points, what works for you. Uh, very, very simple marketing tool. You know, SWOT analysis is one of them, but you know, I don't think any artists like to do opportunities or threats. So just focus on your strengths and improve on your weaknesses. And you know, always ask. You know, if you can meet industry people like today, for example, after that we're gonna have a Q and A. Ask like send us your stuff, ask us stuff. Um, it's kind of like ask me anything kind of session as well. What's good about your stuff or what's not? So like I said, choosing a single focus groups of your target market. That's helped me a lot in choosing the singles for General Bones, uh, and it's worked pretty well for us. So you have to ask, what are the consumption behaviors? What kind of platforms are they going to be at? Are they going to be on Instagram a lot? Are they going to be on Facebook a lot? For example, Joel's fan base is not hugely based on Facebook. They're mostly on Instagram and Twitter. So those are the key targets that he would then approach with his material. And also learn to develop different content for different platforms. Okay, so uh, killer content is king. And when you want to prepare a single, most of the times when I get bands asking me to how to release a single, they're like, oh, we've got our single ready next week. Can we put it out you know, uh, in tomorrow? And I'm just basically tearing my head out and killing myself. That happens a lot. Uh, so I would advise prepare six to eight weeks of content. Um, if you can come up with four weeks, that's an acceptable level. But I find that a lot of artists struggle to come up with four weeks of content. Uh, but I, I really think that six to eight weeks is a good number for people to keep being visible 
to keep people sharing your things, to keep people on the lookout for you. Because you know, if you put out like a something initially, it's gonna slip by some people, right? That's you're not gonna hit everyone today. So continue pulling out stuff, and then you hit more people, more target groups. It's a slow process, which is why you need six to eight weeks of content. If you put out like content for two weeks, then you're only gonna get two weeks worth of numbers. So what's content? You know, there's a lot more, but these are the ones that I think have been proven to work fairly well. Uh, behind the scenes photos, studio footage, um, covers of popular songs, live footage, live photos, announcements, announcements of your launch dates, your pre-order campaigns, your upcoming shows, uh, audio teasers, like if you're putting out a single, put 30 seconds out. You know, a lot of people get insecure and, and tell me, oh, but you know, I don't wanna, let someone have a preview. Uh, but you know, you're an artist, that's kind of your job. And uh, uh, you kind of have to put it out there some way. And it's better for, to, to let people hear a little bit of it. If they like it, they might actually click buy. That's your best case scenario. Your worst case scenario is something you won't know. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. Uh, promo shoots are good. You know, your single cover up is something we use a lot. Uh, merch announcement to go with the single if you're making t-shirts, for example. And obviously, if you're doing a music video, music video teasers. Uh, try to stretch it out. So if you're a good friend to your director, ask him for two cuts if it's possible. Uh, like a behind the scenes cut and a 30 seconds teaser or one minute teaser. Okay. Any questions on, on content? Okay. And I think the key is also to you know, shuffle them around and plan them out correctly, which is why strategy is important, which is something I'm gonna cover in a bit. Um, again, you know, Promotional platforms, find them and, and know that it's a multi channel approach. Uh, but also know that social networking is a two way process and a conversation. This is important. Uh, I think Singaporeans don't like it when you shout out your throats, hey, buy my stuff or listen to my stuff too much. So you gotta sneak it in, in a nicer way, get your friends to share it for you. Uh, if you send you know, preview copies to journalists, then they can review it for you. Uh, blogs can review it for you as well. So these are your couple of platforms, online forums. There's I think five or six forums in Singapore on Facebook and they're soft as well. Um, so use all of them, find all of them uh, and plug all of them. I uh, just want to add that we have an incredibly supportive media and online media um, scene right now in Singapore. This did not used to be the case, but it is now for some yeah. reason. And that's great because what that means is if you were an artist, say, in LA, and you asked all your blogs and the national newspaper even to review your stuff, most of the time you get a big fat no or just an ignore. But over here, you know, people like Kevin in the audience, he's always very happy to review all your stuff. And Soft is also very happy to put your stuff, stuff up, and so on and so forth. You know, it's just so easy to get so many eyeballs for your stuff without paying a single cent. So it behooves all of you, if you're artists, to make use of every single one of those opportunities. W uh, working with uh, two PR agencies and also... What else did I work with? Okay, and, and talking to a few of the media people as well, they're actually hungry for local content. And, and their worry is that there isn't enough quality local content for them to feature. So if you actually have quality stuff, you easily get through the door. I can't think of a press that said no to us when we pitched to uh, General Bones EP. I think ev pretty much every press did a feature on us, did a half page, full page, full cover. Um, and even for me, I was shocked at the amount of response that we got. Um, so that's something for to take note. I think a lot, a lot of times I speak to artists and go, oh, we were kind of afraid that, you're, that no one would want to feature us. But you know, at the end of the day, you have to just put it out there. And if it's quality, you know, you don't have to actually pay for too much for PR agencies as compared to overseas where, you know, uh, PR agencies and the connections are, are king. Like, you know, for Australia, for example, a retainer for a PR person ranges from $2,000 to $4,000 a month to service your release for maybe two to three months. Whereas I think Singapore, uh, yes, I've have, I have worked with a PR agency and, and they've done tremendous results for us, but I will also say that you can do it on yourself. Um, look at all the magazines, find the editor, find the person in charge, email them. Uh, but email them proper stuff, um, you know, good bios and good MP3s or links to them. Don't, don't send funny stuff. I've got, I've got quite a few my, myself. Um, radio servicing is not very hard as well. You know, all your DJs are there, you know, Joe Kim, Sonia, they're supportive. Uh, Vanetta is incredibly supportive for local music. Uh, you just have to find them on the Twitter, get the emails or 
you know, stalk them on Facebook. Don't don't stalk too much, but you know, ask nicely. And um, the, the conversations I've had and, and talking to them uh, in my position has been, if it's good enough, if it's correct for the radio station, they'll play it. If, for example, um, the Summer State, the band I produce, their in first single, I Do, I Don't, wasn't considered by radio as radio hit enough. And then the, the YouTube views hit, I think, 15,000 a day, and radio said, oh, okay, we'll play it. So I think same for Monster Cat. There's an example where, you know, 98.7's rule or, or radio station's rule is playing the hits. So Monster Cat got like a number one on like the first week, so the radio said, oh, okay, we have to play it then. So that's why, you know, we advocate pr you know, producing hits and making sure you get them. Because generally the door just opens and we've also seen artists double, triple, quadruple their prices based on the hit single. And we've seen show offers gone up up to 10 times based on the fact that someone in the company loves the single, loves the artist so much and sends an email going, I'll love to hire you, what's your rates? And we sometimes shoot for the moon. And we get it. So radio servicing, I think initially, if you're putting out your first single, find two to three radio stations that you know suit your material. I think a lot of people get disheartened when, when radio doesn't play their stuff, but in the first place, it's not the right fit. So like I said, research is kind of important. If you're playing really um, singly material, like three minutes 30, pop stuff, you're gonna get in those radio stations. If you're playing more ambient, post-rocky stuff, look at Lush. Indie, Lush is great. Lush is you know super supportive in that sense. Um, Blocks are important as well. Power Pop have been very supportive to us and a lot of local acts. So this is one of them. Uh, there's Spin or Bin as well. Uh, Bandwagon have been very supportive as yeah. well. And here's a little tip. Bandwagon material automatically gets syndicated to Yahoo. So if you want a very nice, prestigious Yahoo feature, just go through Bandwagon. Shh. Okay, so, uh, you know, t how to sell your stuff and, and uh, what kind of numbers are you looking at? And I always go by the simple rule. It's called the conversion rule, 10%. So if you hit 5,000 people, you get 500 sales. If you got five, it's like someone asked me, how many people do you think will show up at my launch? What's your Facebook likes? What's your Instagram likes? If you got 4,000, 300 to 400 is good. So build, build your fan base and look at those metrics and, and base some of your judgment on it. Okay, these things all add up. And like I said, you have to pick your horses. If you're good at Instagram and you're good at Twitter, use those more effectively than Facebook. You know, do something else with Facebook. Like for example, I don't use Twitter at all. Ted's tried to get me on it for like years, and I just I've tried it. I'm terrible at it. I can't fit anything in 140 characters. I just can't. And and I have an account and it's dead. Uh, I like Facebook and I like Instagram for personals, and that's what I focus on. Uh, I think for any new artist or new new producer, focus on two to three um, platforms and learn the intricacies of them well. Uh, learn who are where are the good forums that you can find people looking at your stuff. For example, sometimes I post the stuff on my personal page and I get five likes. And sometimes I post on SG Muso the same content and I get 35 likes. So you know, those are the things. Same for um, for Facebook and Instagram. Instagram, Joel gets you know 1,000 plus likes per photo, and on Facebook it's like 199, 250. So that's a huge gap. So once you sort of understand, you know, try everything first, like I said, try before buy, uh, but then you know, focus on the ones that make you the most returns. Uh, again, incentives to share, not shout. This is something that applies to Singapore only. And I will firstly say that like, I'm used to shouting about my services because I'm a service provider. Like, so I'm a producer and people need to know about my work. Same with Ted. But for artists, you need a little bit more subtlety and I think the people who shout a lot about things, you know, get a lot more hate in general. And I think it's just the truth. Uh, I've seen a lot happen. Uh, okay, a uh, trick, right, is to get other people to shout about you. Then it doesn't come yeah. across as shouty, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So get your friends to rave about you. And like I said, content. if you push out, you know, six to eight weeks of content and you pre stream your release to all the journalists, all the media, all the blogs, then when people review the stuff beforehand, you can share that. So when you share that, it comes across less shouty and more. Here's something someone said about my music. That's the conversation. That's something for people to look, read and look. And a good way is to uh, quote, you know, put the quote as the post. So that people go, oh, that's what this person said about this thing. I'm going to go read the post. So that's engagement right there. That's better than going, hey guys, check out my single. Like if you do that every week on, your, on six to eight weeks, 
instead of people liking your stuff, they'll actually really hate you. So be careful and tread wary. Uh, again, making sense of data from social media insights is one thing that we use a lot, and that's something you know you click insights, you get it. It breaks down everything for you. It breaks down your where the country, where the people are from, um, and the age, sort of the age group. So using that, like I said, devise a good strategy from that. Um, where people are, what people listen to, and again, if you put out a, sing a single, right? So six weeks of content. We've got uh, behind the scenes shoot. Here's one minute, 30 second video on behind the scenes of me recording stuff in the studio. Here's a link to my pre-order sales. So continue doing that. Here's our new photo shoot. Here's a link to our single. Here's um, 30 seconds of the audio link to the single. I think that's something you do constantly. And when you do that, it starts building up, it starts adding up. That's where you see metrics, that's where you see numbers, and that's where you get hits. That that's increases the likelihood of getting a hit. Okay, another very cheap trick, but quite effective from some of my artist friends is uh, don't feel compelled to generate all your content yourself. You know, everyone loves kittens, everyone loves baby animals, everyone loves lolcats, sarcastic, um, you know, things that you get from uh, Nine Gag or whatever. You know, you can use those memes uh, and stuff once in a while. Yeah. Dude Perfect is a good example. Yeah. If you go to Dude Perfect's Facebook, they've always got funny, the funniest stuff to see and uh, it always pops up and lots of people share it. So, but those are, like I said, use it occasionally once in a while. But that's not a bad idea as well. So like I said, the most important thing is getting people to buy your stuff from your actions. So it's call to actions. That's something most imp like very important for everyone to sort of stick in their minds. That really helps get you the numbers before your stuff even gets released. And when you're playing, and then when you, know, if, when you release and your single's already top 10, right? Like nine or eight, that's where you start shouting and going, hey, our single's on top 10, please help us to get it to number one. That's where you can shout a bit more and people will be like, oh, I'll help these guys. So that's, that's kind of what you want. But if you're like, if you open, you know, on number 44, it's hard. Or they click on your YouTube and you have five, five views. <laughs> but yeah, and at the same time, like, you know, when, when you build a hype up, and, and that's something I find that's very, very difficult with Singaporeans in general, building your own hype. It's not easy, uh, but at the same time, you know, you have to question yourself, are you doing this for a living? And if you have to, then that is part of the job title, hyping your material up and getting people interested in it. Uh, instead of going, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo, no one likes my stuff, but no one really knows about it. Okay, so this is a topic that I don't know if everyone's interested in, but getting grants is a very good way to you know, get quality product and a bit of government support and assistance. So the two ones that you need to look at for singles, production of your EP, and the singles press kit one. So that's under market audience and development scheme, and the first one's under the PNP scheme, participation and presentation scheme. So quite a few of the artists I've worked with have good successes um, applying for these ones. And uh, I personally felt that that was also a good change in where the local music industry has come. When these grants were introduced and more artists were getting better funding to put up better po uh, quality products and higher quality products, that's where you know, radio was starting to take more local content up, gigs were, you know, more companies were hiring local bands and paying them better. So. Again, do your research. If you're not ready for an EP, apply for a single. Uh, I think before September 2014, it was mostly an EP grant. So a lot of people felt compelled to apply for EP when they only had maybe three or two or three good songs, or maybe even one. Um, and you know, obviously, if you're on a panel, that makes it hard for you to, to approve a grant that, or, or an artist that has one good song and two or three feelers. So now with the singles ones, I would encourage people to look at those. Uh, instead of the EP one. Again, you have to state your case. Uh, evidence is it's important, stats and insights, and numbers are really, really important. Like, you know, everyone wants to go, oh, yeah, I'm the best thing since you know, sliced bread. But that doesn't really, really work when you want to convince a panel on to why they should give you money to do your project. Uh, keep it short and sweet. sweet. You know, be concise. You know, a lot of people, when I see the grant applications, it's really, really long-winded. Uh, sometimes you just have to answer the questions in point form. I've done that myself, and it's like multi it's like you know c comprehension. Why are you doing this? I'm doing this because that. That's it. You know, it's simple. Um, 
Okay, one of the key questions of the grant is who does your project benefit and do you meet any quotas? Are you contributing to the local scene and in what ways? Uh, so again, those are things that are very, very important. Uh, it can't be me, myself project. So a good way you know, for quotas, for example, I found is to say uh, we're contributing to the radio quota. You know, we're contributing to local content on the radio airwaves, which is not a lot. Because if you hear ra local radio, often it's more or less the same 10 artists. You know, Electrical, Daphne, Sam Milos, Jenna Bones, Ruby, Summer State. You know, I hear these tracks recycled again and again. So stating your case in that sense helps you to do that. Um, your contribution to local music and in what ways. This is something where you, know, you, you have to state your case and you have to actually answer why. Are you creating employment? So uh, sometimes a lot of bands say, I'm going to do everything myself, I'm going to record myself, put it out, everything myself. And that's something where you know, a, a funding body looks at it and go, are you actually actively working in the industry? Are you actually supporting the industry? Are you providing employment for photographers, for mu uh, music video guys, for producers? In fact, for the EP, one of the grants uh, guidelines was you need to work with a producer, a local producer. Uh, that's not enforced strictly, but it's highly um, favoured. So please look at all these guidelines and, and, and answer them pretty well. Uh, and again, what's your unique selling point? This is something we'll go through very, very quickly, but again, something for you to think about. Okay. Also, please send in a good demo. Uh, I've known bands who have been rejected on the first time because they sent in a, a pretty poor demo. So a good demo should be somewhat close to the final arrangement if you're a band. Uh, or if you're a singer-songwriter, get some simple programming on it. Uh, clarity is important if you can't hear the vocals, or if something's really, really a key element of the, the, the band or singer is missing, or it's very muddy, or it's muffled, then that's going to affect you uh, significantly. And no like, obvious mistakes or vocal imperfections. If you're going to go super flat or super sharp on a couple of notes, the panel's going to go Ugh, shaky. That's going to put you in a, a bad spot. Uh, so please take note. Make sure you send in a really, really good demo. Uh, budgeting is important. I think a lot of people look at the figures and go, oh wow, that's a lot of money, for 10 grand I think for the EP grant. And they start budgeting under and they think that that's going to get a grant. But actually, the 10 grand is just a good base and often a lot of budgets I've seen are you know, close to 15, 16 for example. Um, and the, the key thing is to get quotes from reputable people again. Um, if you book a place, you book a venue, and they're giving you sponsorship for the venue, like instead of charging you $1,000 for the venue, they're giving it to you for 500 Get that in writing and put it in your grant as venue costs $500, in-kind sponsorship $500. That makes you look good. That makes the venue look good as well. That, makes, that shows to the panel and the, the, the body that people are invested in you as an artist and your product. So anytime you got an endorsement, support, even if it's a producer giving you a better price, or even if it's um, indie, indie price you get from a mastering engineer overseas, factor that in. Okay, uh, lastly, uh, often people don't budget enough. Uh, the, the general rule is 10 to 15% of your budget. Like, so if you are gonna spend $15,000, uh, always have a conditioning budget of $1,500 to $2,000, and, and factor that in your application form. Okay, more tips. The numbers of uh, most of the grant offices are actually on the website, and I, if you're any time you end up, I would advise for you guys to email them to clarify your situation or give a call. I've personally done a lot of calls myself and, and replied a lot of emails, and I find that every time I, I speak to one of the offices, my understanding of what they're looking for or what they're going to support increases, and they're actually very, very friendly. They, they, they won't bite, and they're actually very happy to share the information with uh, anyone. And I think most of the times I speak to artists, can you go find out why your, your grant application got rejected? And they're like, uh, shy. Yeah, that's what actually what I get. That's the, the exact answer that I actually get. Um, but you know, the first thing, if you don't get your, your grant the first time around is ask, email the person. I think the last time there were quite a number of grant applications were rejected simply because there were too many good artists to give out the grants for and not enough grants to give out to. So don't, don't look at it as, oh crap, I didn't get a grant, I must really, really suck. That's not even half close to the truth. Uh, proofread, this is very, very, very important. Um, you know, if you apply for a grant, it has to make sense to people. It has to make sense to a body, panel members and the grant-making body. So 
get someone outside to read it. A good example would be one person in the music industry to give you valuable guidelines and tips and one from a friend who is not in the music industry so that they actually understand your plan and concept. And when, when they can understand it, then you know you've got something good. If they don't, ask them to clarify and, and, and make sure that they understand what you're trying to sell or what you're trying to get at. So that makes, that's the biggest help that I can give you guys on that. And like I said, don't give up. If you um, apply first time and you fail, uh, if you've got some guts, call up, email, ask what's the reason. Um, again, I've recorded bands that had the first application rejected and on the third time they get it. So, you know, it's never, I, I, and at the same time, I also know artists who get rejected the first time around and have gone, I will never apply for a grant again. Or I, I, they get disheartened and they actually give up. So I think that's also not a good mentality to have. Um, so, like I said, don't give up and figure out what's good or figure out what, what's not good about your application. That kind of internal feedback and conversation is really, really important. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, that was a lot of material. I think we're all tired. Uh, so now uh, to refresh everyone and to clear it up for the next 15 minutes before we move on to Q&A, which is uh, gonna be cool. Uh, please, okay, how many of you have the ability to access this URL on your smartphone? All of you? Does any one of you not have a smartphone on a, on, or the ability to access this URL? Okay, for those, uh, we will give out paper forms, but for the rest of you, uh, please go ahead and do this survey. Um, this survey is important to us because it helps us figure out how we did today and what we can do for future workshops. Today is really just a taster to give you guys some idea of the whole process, but like I said to some of you earlier, every 15 minutes in this seminar is equivalent to one semester. We could do 10, 20 sessions on every 15 minutes very easily. So um, please go to the survey and let us know what you're interested in and we will even throw in some special gifts for those of you that complete it uh, in this entirety. So 15 minutes and then we'll come back to Q&A. Get some drinks, 15% off. <laughs>